my Lord Bishops, Reverend Fathers, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to St. Matthew's Church, Carver Street in the city of Sheffield. Uh, welcome especially to those who are in church and also to those who will be following us via the live stream uh, at this time. Uh, welcome to this, which is now the sixth annual lecture in Catholic evangelism held here in Sheffield. This lecture was inaugurated five years ago uh, this night uh, at the encouragement of Bishop Stephen Croft, the then Bishop of Sheffield, uh, after I was appointed in the post of uh, being parish priest here and also a Catholic missioner in the Diocese of Sheffield. And it's a great joy to have with us here tonight uh, as we uh, hear uh, Bishop Norman uh, address us as the sixth person to address us on this subject to also have uh, Bishop Pete uh, with us, uh, who's been such an encouragement to this lecture and also graces us with his presence here tonight. Of course, we live in unprecedented times, uh, and of course that's why tonight we have a much smaller number of people here in church in person, but it does afford us the opportunity to broadcast to people way beyond this church and throughout the country. It's a great joy to be supported and to be sponsored by the Church Union and the Diocese of Sheffield. Uh, and being able to live cast tonight will give us an audience uh, both throughout the country, but also beyond these shores as well. Many people have been looking forward to this lecture for a number of months now, and I have been especially. Why is that? Well, it is because, my brothers and sisters, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. If death cannot separate us, then neither can COVID-19. And the first call upon all Christian disciples is to go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That call is just as important to us in our own days, despite the challenges that we face, as in more normal times. In fact, my brothers and sisters, maybe there is even a greater imperative on us all to be inspired by our speaker tonight to go out and to make new disciples of Jesus Christ. Welcome to this place. Welcome to the live stream if you're joining us tonight. Uh, and a warm welcome to both Bishop Norman and Bishop Pete. So I'd now like to invite Bishop Pete to introduce uh, Bishop Norman Banks, our speaker tonight. Thank you, Father Grant, very much. And uh, dear friends, it is a great pleasure to add a brief welcome to the one that Father Grant has already extended to this sixth annual lecture in Catholic evangelism. And as Father Grant said, welcome both to those who are physically present and to those who are joining us online. Established in 2015, this lecture has quickly become a significant part of the life of the Diocese of Sheffield. The mission of Jesus to draw men and women to the knowledge of God as creator and redeemer by the power of the Spirit is far too great a matter to be left to any one tradition of the church. But there is a good case to be made that the Church of England stands in particular need at the present time of a recovery of the insights of a distinctively Catholic evangelism. Missionary vigour is not confined to any one part of the church. And the whole church truly only flourishes when every part is responding urgently, as Father Grant has reminded us, to the call of Jesus to make disciples. Since this time last year, I've had the extraordinarily inspiring experience of reading Pope Francis's great summons to the evangelization in the Catholic tradition, Gaudium Evangelii, the joy of the gospel, I dare say, others of you present have read it too. One of my favorite quotations in that book goes like this. In virtue of their baptism, all the members of the people of God have become missionary disciples. All the baptized, whatever their position in the church or their level of instruction in the faith, are agents of evangelization. And it would be insufficient to envisage a plan of evangelization to be carried out by professionals while the rest of the faithful would simply be passive recipients. The new evangelization calls for personal involvement on the part of each of the baptized. Every Christian is challenged here and now to be actively engaged 
in evangelization. Just by the way, if you will forgive me for briefly mounting a hobby horse, not the least of the insights of Catholic evangelism from which I have learned is its use of that verb, evangelization, in place of the noun, evangelism. This is faithful to the New Testament usage in which the practice of proclaiming the gospel is always an activity and never a thing. You will not find the Greek word euangelismos anywhere in the Bible. My prayer is that this lecture and lecture series will inspire the dynamic activity of evangelization afresh in our generation across this diocese and throughout God's church. I'm therefore immensely grateful to Bishop Norman for accepting the invitation to speak tonight. Bishop Norman has been Bishop of Richborough since 2011, providing extended Episcopal oversight to parishes in the eastern half of the southern province, I was learning, from Grimsby to the Isle of Wight, no small area of responsibility. For a decade before that, he was the Vicar of Walsingham, and before that exercised a long parochial ministry in the northeast. It was only in preparation for this introduction tonight that I discovered to my delight that through the late 1980s and the 1990s, he and I were near neighbours, albeit he was based north of the time in the Diocese of Newcastle, while I was south of it in the Diocese of Durham. Ordained in 1982, uh, deacon in 1982 and priest in 1983, he comes to us with almost 40 years' experience of his subject. Would you therefore please join with me in extending to Bishop Norman a hearty Sheffield welcome. Being given a book can be a very mixed blessing because it usually comes with the obligation to read it. One that I put aside for several years that I've recently caught up with came with the unusual title of The Rituals of Dinner. It's written by Margaret Beiser. And what a fascinating read it's turned out to be. I didn't know that taking a bottle of wine with you to a dinner party in some European countries is regarded as an insult. It implies that your host isn't to be trusted as a good judge of wine. And that, she says, in Spain and Italy, if you take some wine with you, it implies that you're worried that your host might be not very generous in keeping your glass full. In some parts of the world, if you take chocolates, they are studiously ignored by the host in case the host appears greedy. While in America, chocolates must be opened and passed around at the end of the meal to show the host's generosity. And by the way, I discovered in reading this book, avoid taking flowers of a single color. They still can convey messages that can result in all kinds of misunderstandings and embarrassment. When while swapping stories uh, about our holidays, someone might tell you about the fact that they were on a train in a far-flung country, and much to their surprise and delight, one of the locals offered them a sandwich. They tell you just how delicious it was, how grateful they were at that generosity. Little did they realise that the local culture may well have demanded that you have to share food with a stranger, but the stranger is then supposed to refuse it politely. Once I was leading a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and had a particularly good driver, a Muslim driver, and at the end of the pilgrimage, before we got to the airport, we had one last meal at a service station. And he was going off to have his with the other drivers. And he said to me, would I have my meal with him? So I went off and shared the meal with the other drivers. 
It was just as I was about to get back onto the coast that someone came running across and said, do you realize the significance of what's just happened? Your driver has asked you to share some food with him. He's allowed you to dip your bread in the same bowls as he has. What he's trying to tell you that he's been your companion on this pilgrimage. And more than that, during this time, he has become your brother. It was only when I was reading, which I found very touching, I may say, very touched. It was only when I was reading this book about rituals of dinner uh, that I realized that it would have been very useful to have read it before I'd actually gone to Israel and Palestine. Margaret Weiser says something that had me blushing and going hot and cold because I remembered when I was having this meal with my Muslim driver, because I was nervous about getting to the airport and looking after the pilgrims, I attacked the food and ate rather quickly. She writes, advising people, when eating with one's hands is done from a common dish, hurrying of any kind is shocking because it looks as though you want to take your companion's share of food and never put more food into your hand until you have swallowed the previous mouthful. You can see why I thought about it. I started to go hot and cold, feel embarrassed about the way I had behaved without intention. It was a recent comment from a vicar after a Sunday confirmation in a large evangelical church, which has well in place a rather sophisticated plan of action for anybody that comes through their doors, that both struck me forcefully uh, and became the seed of preparing this lecture this evening. The vicar said to me, in a rather nonchalant sort of way, you know, there is a science to welcome and hospitality. What a strange phrase to use. There is a science to welcome and hospitality. It seemed to me when he said it, that's rather cold, calculating, even forensic. As if suggesting that any new person, once they got past the main door of the church, would be subjected to a series of well thought out stratagems in order to hook and reel them in. Yet I have to admit that the church was full, the congregation seemed happy and committed, and it was growing, and it had an impressive program of Christian teaching and social outreach. And that reminded me of going back to my younger days when I, before I was ordained, going right back to the 1970s, when I heard a sermon which affected me then and still haunts me now, all those years later. It was at St Luke's War's End on the time. It was just as, some of us will remember, when St Mary the Belfry in York was beginning to, as they say, pack them in under the inspiring leadership of their then vicar, David Watson. Well, my parish priest decided to go and find out what was happening there. And so from the pulpit, he told us that the service was fine, not a great deal different from usual Sunday worship, except that the church was full to overflowing. And then he said, after the service, a young couple came up to me and asked the usual questions about whether I was just visiting or whether I had recently moved to the area. Then he said, they said, why don't you come and have lunch with us? He said, had I been new to the area, or had come to church looking for something, or even just curious, I think I would have been hooked. I was offered companionship. And then from the pulpit, I'll never forget this, he looked down on us all and said, 
I can't think of anyone in this church, including myself, who would do the same. We offer Eucharistic hospitality for those in the know and a cup of coffee afterwards. But then our hospitality largely peters out. I think that every church congregation will say that they are a friendly congregation. The question is whether that friendliness is simply amongst themselves or whether it is shared with others. And so this evening, a few questions, challenges, and even suggestions around welcome and well-being and hospitality. We don't have to look far into scripture or the tradition to find a wealth of material ready and waiting to aid us, to support us and to challenge us. While the work of anthropologists, behaviorists, social scientists, the list goes on and on, are giving us plenty of new insights around the complexities and subtleties of human interaction and relationships. It was in a recent article by David Baldwin, which was in the Oak Hill College magazine, that was a personal game changer. I hadn't realised how much work was actually been doing in this whole field, an indicator in itself of all this work is being done of how crucial it is that we take welcome and hospitality seriously for the good health, even the survival of the church and our Christian communities. Much to learn from in that article. And he quotes from a series of books, some of which I've, um, I've had a look at. Andrew Arpery's book, Entertaining Angels, Early Christian Hospitality in this Mediterranean Setting. My gosh, Rethana's Simply Eat, Everyday Stories of Friendship, Food and Faith, and Rosaria Butterfield's The Gospel Comes with a House Key, Practicing Radically Ordinary Hospitality in Our Post-Christian World. Many years ago, I worked with an elderly sister from the community of the Holy Name, Sister Constance. She was a historian by background, and she'd often muse that she wondered whether Christianity really took hold because it was so attractive in the homes of Roman families. In those very early years of the faith, it struck mothers who were disillusioned by the decadent religions that surrounded them that the example and teachings of Jesus and his followers was wholesome, it was good. She used to say, Christianity should be like the smell of fresh baking bread on the air. Authentic spiritual food on which to be nourished and nurtured. And she felt that that's what those, it's her term, those Roman matrons were doing when they discovered this new faith, Christianity. And it's often advised by estate agents that when you're trying to sell your house, prospective buyers should smell, you know it, freshly brewing coffee and bread baking in the oven when they come around to see not a house, but a home. All kinds of examples from literature that I might use, but it was recently a Radio 4 um, book that was being serialized. It's called A Monk in Siena by Hisham Mata. And maybe it was because I was preparing for tonight, but I was listening to it on the radio and then I was struck by something that he said. The chapter that remains with me is not the author's wonderful descriptions of the art and architecture of that beautiful city, Siena. Rather a time when he's feeling lonely, and by chance, a family invites him to their house for coffee, which turns into a meal and blossoms into friendship. He experiences a warmth, generosity, and openness, a vulnerability in that home, that enriches him, changes him, allows him to celebrate, savour, enjoy, delight in the mutuality 
of humanity, of humans. And if we turn to the Bible, we only get as far as the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, when Abraham and Sarah welcome those three strangers by the oak of Mamre with full Middle Eastern hospitality. Just as well, because they discover that they have been entertaining angels. And then when we come to the New Testament, much of what Jesus did and thought centers around food. Tim Chester points out in his book, A Meal with Jesus, quote, while the Son of Man came to seek and save and to serve, bizarrely, he also came eating and drinking. Luke's Gospel. So prominent was this that glutton and drunkard was the tab he was labelled with. He hung out with unworthy people, in unworthy homes, eating and drinking. As one writer has commented on St. Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. Did Jesus have a problem, or do I? On a recent visit to the Holy Land, when we were in Jericho, one of the highlights for me was stopping at the sycamore tree as recorded, where Zacchaeus perched himself to have a glimpse of Jesus. And although the story is only to be found in St. Luke's Gospel, it is surprisingly detailed. Zacchaeus has grown wealthy as a tax collector, working probably for the Romans. His great wealth has been accumulated by a fair bit of corruption and extortion. We're told he's short, and he was probably rotund. And no one is going to find room for him at the front of the crowd. So climbing the tree can't have been very dignified for this man. He really must have wanted to see and hear this young rabbi that everybody was talking about. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. Not I'd like to, or may I, I must. And the outcome of the meal they had together, it's recorded, salvation comes to Zacchaeus' house, which means eternal life, the very purpose of Jesus' earthly mission. Generosity is released in Zacchaeus, and he returns his ill-gotten gains with interest. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what is lost. Turning to the letters of St. Paul, we see the imperative to hospitality at the heart of his missionary advice. Romans 12, pursue hospitality. First letter to Timothy, elders should be hospitable. While the first letter of St. Paul, of St. Peter, from Peter you would accept, expect no less, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And of course, in the letter to the Hebrews, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. This lecture is sponsored by the Church Union. It's happening in a much valued and loved Anglo Catholic Church, well known for its beautiful liturgy and Catholic teaching. Those of us here this evening, and those who follow to the end online will do so because we are committed to Catholic evangelism and discovering new ways to deliver it. As Christians within the Catholic continuum in the Church of England, it's fairly obvious that the whole area of welcome and hospitality needs to be reviewed and refreshed. As the speed of societal change accelerates, we need to keep pace with these changes, finding ways of helping others to access our tradition and experience the faith as revealed. 
There are shelves full of books. And some excellent examples of good practice for us to learn from. But most seem to be geared to more evangelical models of evangelism. And they don't easily translate into our own context. Quiche and salad just doesn't do it for most of us. What then can we realistically do? Where do we find the energy and the vision and the impetus to put welcome and hospitality as top priorities in our mission? It hardly needs to be said that for Catholics, it unapologetically must begin and flow from the Eucharist. But we must also recognize that so much of the imagery and practice and history we take for granted is unknown, alien, and regarded as irrelevant to the daily lives of most people. So let's go back to absolute basics. The Eucharist is food. Food is food, no matter how we wrap it up and spiritualize it. And food was central to Jesus during his earthly ministry. Time and time again, he invited himself to eat in people's houses, often with those regarded as ritually unclean by the temple authorities. He performed miracles with food and relaxed with friends over meals. And at his ultimate gathering with the disciples, the Last Supper, he takes bread and wine and at the breaking of the bread, inaugurates the new covenant. Such was and is the impact of his actions, re-ritualizing the Passover from a covenant of law to a covenant of love, that Christians have treasured and honored and refined that final meal, the Eucharist, that is celebrated in churches across the world. But the gap between what we do in church and general understanding of what we do is widening. And we cannot allow it to become an uncrossable chasm. We cannot allow it to become an uncrossable chasm. I read a recent article in the tablet about one of my favorite films, the 1986 Babette's Feast. A regular column writer, Father Richard Leonard, was suggesting that if we're unable to get to Mass for Corpus Christi, at least we might watch a film such as Babette's Feast. Babette, a French chef who loses her husband and son in the Paris riots of 1871, escapes to Denmark and has taken on as a cook by two sisters whose late father had been a pastor of a strict puritanical sect. It's a dull, lackluster life, the food largely consisting of bread, potato, and herring. And then after 14 years, she wins the Paris lottery and spends all 100,000 francs on one lavish meal for the whole village. The village grudgingly experienced the rich food, their first ever, and despite themselves, despite all the resisting that they do, they are changed by it. Over and over again, a feast is one of the great metaphors Jesus uses to describe his kingdom. Conviviality means sharing in a feast. Where Jesus takes conviviality to another level is his insistence that the best of everything is provided for rich and poor alike. Luke 14. When you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So as Jesus prepares to leave the disciples, he gifts them a meal, the Last Supper. Only gradually do they, then the early Christian communities, and then the growing church, begin to understand the significance of what he said and did, and what he proposed.
bequeathed to him on that fateful night. So back then, to go back to space, should we be surprised that the results of a carefully prepared, generous and significant meal are life transforming? And if this is true for the best guests, how much more and more and more is it true when Jesus, the Son of God, is the host of the banquet? We instinctively understand this as Catholics. Our churches lavish time, energy and love on the Eucharist, holding together so many elements of the rite that try to express what we're about which is far, far more than simply commemorating our Lord's final meal with his disciples. Indeed, rituals surrounding the Mass have taken centuries to evolve and fine-tune, so as to hold in balance various elements of the mystery that is Holy Communion, the Body and Blood of Jesus, Christ's sacrifice on the cross, New Covenant, Bread of Angels, Banquet of Heaven, the list goes on and on. So we share the feast, conviviality. We have fellowship with one another, companionship. We share in the life of the persons of the Trinity, divine conversation. All three would begin with con, which means with, because Christian life is always with others. It would be easy to compare and find wanting a typical Sunday Eucharistic celebration to the bountifulness of Babette's feast. Even Babette only managed to offer such total magnif magnificent generosity once. At the other end, we might suggest that what goes on in our churches with lukewarm instant coffee and plain biscuits after Mass in no way equates to an agape or a Christian love feast. But if Christ welcomes us to the feast with such gracious, generous self-giving, can we respond by doing less? Can the truly converted person be anything less than hospitable, generous, kind? So let's try to reconnect as best we can with the rituals of what happens at the altar, which express the generosity of God. To reconnect that with the rituals that fill our everyday lives so that both better inform each other. Neil McGregor, the former director of the National Gallery in the British Museum, has written about his most recent radio series, Living with the Gods, with these words. We are in a very unusual society. We are trying to do something that no society has really done. We are trying to live without an agreed narrative of our communal place in the cosmos and in time. Our nation is trying to become a society functioning without religious belief at its core. He implies, and I agree, this is dangerous territory for our nation. And so this is why I am beginning to understand what my evangelical friend means by the science of welcome and hospitality and the urgency for us to engage and learn from this dispassionate approach. Yes, we are living in an immediate gratification, fast food, disposable culture with rapidly changing patterns of social behaviour that is true, but is there not therefore an imperative as Christians, as Catholics, to try to recalibrate what is going on and not simply to be left behind? First steps don't have to be complicated. 
And a good place to start is to rethink what we mean and do and are about when it comes to welcome and hospitality. As a Christian host, there's absolutely no need to be a sophisticated entertainer or a gifted conversationalist. Quite simply, what we are called to do is to be creators of space to allow for the working of the Holy Spirit. It's worth saying that again. What we are called to do is to be creators of space to allow for the working of the Holy Spirit. So why not invite another person to share some food with you? It doesn't need to be a meal in your own home. Coffee and a muffin in the local cafe will do equally well. The difference is, at least for some of the time, consciously let Jesus in to share the conversation. Because as Christians, sharing food and fellowship should always have a special sacred dimension. So let's consciously try to reconnect the rituals of what happens at the altar with our everyday lives and let them feed into each other. Because if having coffee with someone can give us a feel-good factor, just think of the fruits and joys of helping someone to experience the Eucharist, to taste the goodness of the Lord. Spending time, effort and energy to introduce, encourage and nurture another person into Catholic worship and sacramental life is worth, well, words can't even begin to describe it. Let's return to Zacchaeus. Salvation has come to this house, said Jesus. Well, salvation is experience over a meal. How? It's because Jesus and Zacchaeus, and no doubt his family and some of his friends, talked together over that meal. And Zacchaeus, without realizing it, shared a conversation with a person of the Trinity. It changed him during that meal, generosity and energy released, and the kingdom in broke, and the kingdom was celebrated. To be personal for a moment towards the end of the lecture, which saints have helped me most these last few years? Well, it's been Surprisingly, two Spanish saints living 500 years ago, St. Teresa of Jesus, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. John of the Cross. The Eucharist was at the centre of their lives, and so was natural, lively conversation with Jesus. St. Teresa, whose friendship with our Lord is described with breathtaking honesty in her autobiography, and her manuals of prayer for her sisters in community. And St. John of the Cross, whose poetry and commentaries give us a glimpse of tantalizing taste of what conversation with the divine should be. So I want to conclude by letting these two friends of Jesus, Teresa and John, friends of mine, speak about what friendship with God means to them. How that friendship with the Lord, they show us how it can grow in us and why it's so important and special to help others join in the conversation so that they can feast with the Lord. My most favourite words from her book, The Way of Perfection. If you are alone, you must look for a companion. Imagine it is the Lord himself who is at your side. Believe me, you should stay with such a good friend for as long as you can before you leave him. Do you think it is a small thing 
to have such a friend as that beside you. She says the gate of entry is prayer, which is the conversation we have with the persons of the Trinity. Prayer is the door that opens up the mystery of God and at the same time a means of communing with him. It actuates the personal relationship with the Lord present in the very depths of the Spirit. St. John was greatly encouraged and influenced by Teresa in his own spiritual journey. And he found himself naturally in conversation with the Trinity. The inner stillness where meditation leads, the Spirit secretly anoints the soul and heals our deepest wounds. However softly we speak, God is so close to us that he can hear us. Nor do we need wings to go in search for him. And we should not be surprised to find he is such a good guest. Catholic mission and evangelism, when we allow it to, naturally engages us with the holy and the sacred. It allows God to help us to grow into a healthy Eucharistic community when his generosity can then flow from us and into others, so that the texture and quality of life may be transformed by sacramental fellowship and divine conversation. What we are aiming for and what we're about is when it happens that the host and the guest become as one, when the host and the guest become as one. I want to end with the conclusion of St. John's Gospel. You know the scene. When the disciples landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. When I hear those words, and imagine that scene on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the delicious smell of fish and bread on the air, it makes me hungry, physically hungry, and spiritually hungry. And what does Jesus do? First, he physically feeds his disciples. And then, having had some fellowship with them, he has that final, all-important conversation with St. Peter as he forgives, restores, and commissions him. Some of his last words are about feeding. Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, feed my sheep. As Catholic Christians, conviviality, companionship, and conversation with the Lord are central to spiritual well-being and wellness. We can do it better than we're doing it. We can share it more than we share it. Brothers and sisters, hospitality is the gospel. take some questions uh, and so uh, we will open the questions now to people uh, both within the room and also people who are online and I invite uh, Father Adam Edwards uh, from the Church Union to uh, come and give some of those questions that you've that we've been posted online so if people are online at the moment then do uh, comment uh, below on the pages and we'll get around the three pages to make sure that we can um, post your questions uh, to Bishop Norman now Bishop Norman, there have been a couple of questions about how we do hospitality uh, in the current situation and, and what, what your thoughts are around that at the moment. Uh, well, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that, really. But that should give us, of course, a, 
a yearning and a longing to do it, and we should be using this time to be preparing um, that when we come out of lockdown, an awful lot of people are going to feel particularly lonely and isolated and uh, bereft. And so it is an opportunity that we can use in the right way to, to share hospitality and be more conscious in the way that, that we do it. Uh, but as I'm saying, the way we do it, the, the key to it all is, is, is letting Jesus be part of it, of, of the hospitality that we're sharing. That's, that's, that's the key. So let's get ourselves ready when lockdown is over to be out there um, drawing people back. I mean, a lot of people are going to be losing skills of actually social interaction during this time. And you know, if, if we could help with that, that would be a wonderful thing to do, just to, to help to keep, give people their confidence confidence about. It. And to say that can be simply a, a cup of coffee in the local cafe. That might be life changing post COVID or something. Thank you. Um, the person who asked it has just said great answer, so <laughs> um, another question is have you got any practical hints or advice on evangelism with young people aged 18 to 35? Well, food. I mean <laughs> <laughs> People 18 to 35 love food, and so just find imaginative ways. I mean, when I was running youth clubs, most of my Sunday evening youth clubs centered around food in some way or other, whether it was fish and chips or takeaway pizza or ice cream or whatever. But, but, but somehow food is a, is, is, is a vehicle in the way people relax around food. And, and even young people, when they're all talking at once, if they've actually got their mouths full, might just for a minute listen to each other. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say that this is this is this is something that our tradition has got us to relearn. We're very good at sacred food, but we've hardly begun to think how we might be able to use food generally in the way that Jesus used it uh, in order to get across his message. Uh, question for me, actually, if you don't mind, is uh, you mentioned the aspect of companionship and friendship and sort of breaking bread and, and real food. What about the importance of breaking spiritual food with friends and the importance of spiritual direction for Christians? Well, I think, you know, it's, you know, it, 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 it's what I wanted to do this, this evening was to go right back to, to basics. But I hope I've managed also to communicate something about what it's all about and what is it all about. It's not about having more people in church. And, it, it, and that's a wonderful thing, that's not what it's about. It's about the fact that we believe that having a, a living relationship with the Lord, that walking with Jesus, as I often say while preparing people for confirmation, you know, if you grasp the hand of Jesus and walk with him through your life, then the texture and quality of your life changes. You see things in a new and different ways. And so things that might not be, you might not see as being spiritual, really aren't spiritual. But you begin to become more intuitive, uh, more aware, more aware of them. But you know, I, I, what I think the barrier is, or the chasm that's growing, is is to go from from square one to square four or five. We're wanting people to make the leap. It's where we want them to be. It's where we are. But we've got to do the hard work of going through the other stages to get to to that point. So yes, to to you know, to, to savor some food together is the beginnings of it, but what we want them to do is to savour uh, the food that is Christ himself. Any questions in the room? Um, my, my issue is, um, and I must share this with the guy that I was confirmed in 1959, I made a promise that I would attend the Eucharist every Sunday, which I've run apart from what you can do on one hand when I have a meeting on a, a vessel or, or in the air. And then when I've gone on holiday, the first thing I look for is a church that's suitable. Um, and uh, 
Now, you have not mentioned something which has changed radically, I think, in the church since that time, and that is the sharing of the peace. You can tell a church by the way that the peace is conducted. I've been in many churches, and sometimes it's a, a general talk that we must get in touch with everybody, and in some places it's just trying to recognize people who perhaps you don't know and you want to find out about. So, how important do you think that peace is? Well, I'm more interested in pre-peace and post-peace. So the, the, the pre-peace is to begin something with relationships so that when the peace happens, it's authentic. So something happens between the two people if in Christ they share the peace. And once you've shared the peace, a bit like that Muslim um, coach driver with me in, 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 in dipping our bread in the same in the same dish, that then brings a responsibility that should become post-peace. And so you sh it should not be that we share the peace with someone, if we knew, know they're a new person or whatever, and then we walk away from them. Because we've actually entered uh, into a sacramental contract in the sharing of the peace. So I would, and I, I, I mean, it's an excellent question, because I, I, I want to give the, the peace a deeper quality. So it's not an empty symbol, just for something that we do at that point in the service. It's to think in advance what we're doing when we're offering the peace, and then to take that peace beyond into a relation. And that's why I think that, um, that wonderful novel, um, a, month in the, a Month in Siena, is so wonderful because it just begins with someone offering a cup of coffee, which is a kind of offering of the peace. He goes to the family, and then the way in which they welcome him into the family their, their, their vulnerability and the way, the way they surround him with, with the reality of their lives changes him for the better. So for the peace to be the peace that is Christ's peace, when we offer it, it should change us and it should change the other person for good. Well, friends, to round off the uh, evening this evening, I just want to, uh, on your behalf, express um, some thanks. Um, first of all, to Father Grant and to the home team here at St Matthew's for the uh, extraordinary efforts that they've gone to to make sure that this lecture can go uh, ahead for um, enabling some of us to gather here uh, in the building and others to join us uh, online. And I think these goodie bags are kind of symbolic of the adaptations which have had to be uh, made for this evening and are typical, if I may say, of the hospitality of this uh, holy house. So, uh, Father, please pass on our thanks to uh, your team. Uh, secondly, Father Adam, to you and to the Church Union, um, not only for your sponsorship of uh, this um, lecture, but for all the ways in which you um, support the uh, sustaining of ordained ministry in this diocese and, uh, and other dioceses in the country. We're, we're really, truly grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but most of all, of course, to Father Norman for uh, that um, encouraging and thought-provoking uh, lecture. There are um, three things that I know I will continue to reflect upon. Um, first of all, that set of three con uh, words um, uh, full of meaning for us. Um, secondly, that uh, encouragement that even in our most ordinary interactions to let Jesus in and let him be part of the uh, conversation. But I think especially uh, for me this evening, um, the challenge with which you've left me is to uh, consider in a very intentional way. Um, when it is my privilege to preside at the Eucharist, what, what could I do to ensure that that celebration is a more vivid foretaste of God's coming uh, kingdom? What, what could I do to, uh, to, to offer to the participants in that um, Eucharistic celebration a sense of, uh, of feast, of being caught up uh, in, a, in a feast. It was uh, John Wesley, surprisingly, wasn't it, who um, called Holy Communion a converting audience. And, and I'm sure that you're right. Uh, the, more, the, the more vividly we can in the Eucharist anticipate a sense of kingdom banquet, the more powerfully uh, converting that ordinance will be. Uh, so, Father, um, thank you so much for being here, for making the journey up to um, this diocese this evening and for your lecture. Uh, we're very grateful indeed. Thank you.
So uh, just to uh, convey our thanks uh, on behalf of uh, the diocese and on behalf of this parish, Father, there is a little something for you to sub uh, when you get home. A uh, little something for you there to enjoy. Uh, and also uh, something for Bishop Pete and for Kathy, uh, some Anglo-Catholic book tokens. Uh, again, for you to enjoy after, after the drive home. Uh, and for everyone else who's here, as Bishop Pete alluded to, uh, sorry for people who are uh, joining us virtually, uh, but you don't get a bloody bag at home. But there is uh, just a little something with some hospitality uh, in there. Again, for you to enjoy after the drive. There are uh, non-alcoholic varieties as well available. Uh, and something for you to eat as well. Um, I always remember um, when I was at St Stephen's house that there was a, a particular morning when uh, a group of uh, students was leaving uh, the prayers and we had to come up with our own intentions. And I don't know whether this uh, person who was trained the priesthood that actually left their teeth out that morning, but I always remember it was a particularly difficult time in uh, the Middle East. And I think there was some trouble between Lebanon and Israel. And one of the old nuns prayed for the end of hospitality throughout the Middle East, uh, which point uh, the images of the club are being thrown out and Tabebia. Uh, but fortunately, that prayer was not answered. Uh, but the prayers for an end to hostilities in that time were for a little while. It's been a great joy uh, to welcome you into this place uh, today, whether you've joined us online uh, or in person. Uh, and the lecture will take place uh, next year on Saturday the 25th. This lecture will be uh, shared online uh, by the Church Union, the Diocese and also the Parish, uh, but will also be in a written format in the Church Union Observer uh, in due course. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for joining us in this place. And if I can just ask uh, Bishop Pete to give us his blessing before we return home tonight. If you are able, may I invite you to stand. May God, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish, strengthen, and settle you in the faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.